they never found one single part of either airplane that allegedly crashed into World Trade Center 1 and 2. As you know, uh, all parts in an uh, airplane uh, must be certificated and marked uh, either um, uh, it emblazoned or, or uh, painted or somehow put on that uh, part what its authorization number was. There's 7.5 million parts uh, between the two airplanes, and they didn't find one, not one single part. So as far as the uh, Pentagon airplane, that was an overfly. Uh, the one airplane, uh, whoever was flying it, flew north of the Sitco station, and as it became, became a beam of the part of this uh, Pentagon where it was uh, supposed to hit, they set off explosives uh, and made that hole. Of course, the hole wasn't big enough for an airplane to go through. And April Gallup, who was a Pentagon employee, uh, was sitting 40 feet away from that hole. Uh, she had her six-month-old son in his uh, baby seat right below her desk. And when the explosion went off, uh, there was a bunch of stuff that came down from the ceiling. But when it all stopped, uh, she grabbed him, put him over her shoulder, and crawled out that hole. Uh, that the, uh, the bomb made. She said she spelled no fuel, saw no airplane, saw no drone, saw no missiles, um, smelled no diesel, fuel, jet A, jet B, nothing like that. Uh, she went out on the lawn and uh, to get triage, and she was approached by Navy and or Army intelligence and has, per has been harassed ever since uh, to try and change her story that she saw an airplane, which she didn't, and, and she has stuck to her story. As far as the, um, the other airplane in uh, Shanksville, uh, there couldn't possibly have been an airplane crash there. There wasn't near enough wreckage. There was no wreckage there. But what happened is <clears throat> it was supposed to crash at 11 o'clock, and it was supposed to crash, or the, the fake crash. Uh, they used um, holograms. Uh, whatever they used to, um, uh, to make the holograms apparently became inoperable so that when it came time to hit uh, Building 7, um, nothing happened. And um, uh, so they already had it rigged to uh, explode, uh, and they didn't know what to do. So they quickly, uh, within six hours, uh, went down to Shanksville, uh, found a place that looked like uh, could, could be a wrecked airplane, put a couple of parts in there, and had some people stand around in hazmat suits. <coughs> and uh, they let the Keep right, there and then the exit didn't right. See anything happen at 5 o'clock. And they were told about Shanksville, went down to Shanksville, and they were told that's where the airplane crashed. But of course, there was no airplane. And, exit uh, right. The, one of the things that happened, there's a um, uh, a unit in the airplane, ACARS unit, and it transmits certain information uh, from the engines uh, and the airframe to the airplane company uh, to tell them how the flight's going. That was still transmitting four hours after the airplane supposedly crashed in Shanks. So other than that, uh, Duncan, uh, do you have any questions? Okay, my question is, I recall in one of your previous interviews, it's to do with the holographic technology. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what you believe the state of the art of holographic technology is? Because um, I'm aware of some stories, but I know that a lot of people in the audience are going to have a bit of an issue understanding how a holographic um, image can um, be affected and where the technology has come that far. So tell us what you know on that, please. Holographic um, uh, engineering has... Uh, uh, technology has been around for about 40 years. Uh, I had a friend who was in the uh, television industry and about uh, 15 years ago <clears throat> she was invited to a um, presentation. Uh, uh, all they did was say uh, the history and future of television and uh, there was a small auditorium held about 100 people and uh, she went in there, it was a brightly lit auditorium, the lights weren't out or anything, and there was a little stage there. And she goes and she sits down with about um, 80 people. They were, you know, the high, high people of uh, television and, and movie industry there. 
And uh, so they sat down and this guy comes out from behind the curtain and uh, comes up the podium and uh, says his name and says, start talking about the history of television. And he talks about uh, developing the cathode ray tube and all the stuff they had to go through. And as he's talking, he steps down off the stage and goes up one aisle and then comes down and then goes up the other aisle and comes down and then climbs back up on the uh, uh, stage and goes up on the podium. And it all took about 20 minutes and my friend says, boy, it was boring as hell. And uh, so he gets to the end and he says, who knows what holds uh, the advance of uh, television movies today? And when he said today, he disappeared. It was all Oliver. And that was 15 years ago. And about 10 years ago, a friend of mine, Norman Bergram, who wrote the uh, Ringmakers of Saturn, you'll know that he was uh, very, very, um, uh, worked for many of the high uh, electronics and aviation companies, uh, all of them. And he was very, very knowledgeable. And uh, he wrote the Ringmakers of Saturn. He got a hold of some of the voices and two pictures from Saturn. And in the rings, he found a spaceship that was um, 30,000 miles long and 2,400 miles in diameter. And uh, he talks about how he found this, and he shows the pictures and enlarges and, and shows what uh, he found. Anyway, I used to visit him every once in a while, and the, the, I visited him after 9-11, and uh, I told him my theory of a hologram. He said, yeah, I have no doubt of that. And I said, why? He says, because once I was driving to work um, from, he lived in um, uh, Los Altos Hills, uh, near San Francisco, and he was driving down to um, south of there where um, Lockheed is. And he said he was just driving along, and he saw a shadow. He had a friend with him in the car, and they looked up, and here's a 747 just flying right along with him, uh, of course, going much faster. And just for about 30 seconds, they watched it fly over and then disappeared. And he said, that was my introduction to hologram. He said, so I know it exists. So um, it exists, uh, and that's what people saw in uh, Manhattan. Um, holograms can, uh, they have light, sound, um, just every kind of uh, thing that you would expect to see. There's nothing they project against. They just project it out of thin air. So that's the story on uh, Thank you, that's a very advanced technology. I've had a question from the audience. Um, where are the passengers of flight MH17? And um, I just want to I just want to say to you, I've been tracking this, this story also, and we've had a lot of people ask about this very thing. Jim Stone, as you know, is very controversial on some of his stances and topics. Not everyone agrees with everything he says. But in this particular case, I've got to say that um, the first eyewitnesses did report um, two jets shadowing the, uh, the plane over the Ukraine and the first reports of the people amongst the bodies were that these bodies are in advanced state of decomposition. That was the first thing and so it feeds into this sort of story. But where, what do you, in answer to the question, where do you think the passengers of MH17 are? What do you think happens to a disappeared crew of people? Yeah, first of all, let me say that uh, <coughs> um, the crash of 370, when they shot it down, it was timed exactly for the uh, the time when the shooting started at uh, Gaza, at the Gaza Strip. As to the passengers of uh, MH17, this, this uh, scenario, this shoot down, has been planned for a long, long time. And um, my theory is that they, that was all fake passengers, all the passengers you see crying for their loved ones and stuff is all fake they're all actors and uh so that airplane never took off so there was no nowhere place for uh, all the passengers to go they didn't exist yeah you're going to have problems with that because there's a, a couple of australians who actually know people who were supposed to be on that plane and they've they are dead or or disappeared so i mean i, I appreciate all theories are a work in in transit but i just had a, 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 um, a message from one of the people in the audience so i mean there were genuine passengers who are not returning back to their loved ones 
it would appear on flight uh, MH17 at least. But um, it's 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 um, the same questions came up with 9/11. There was the plane that supposedly crashed in Pennsylvania, and there were those rumours on the internet about people um, living in remote places who are not allowed to talk anymore about the fact that they were on the plane. I don't know. It's I don't think John can answer that question and, and um, any more than I can. But I mean, you've heard John's well, theory that they didn't exist in the first place. The fact is that it was MH370 that crashed in Ukraine. Whatever happened to MH17, I don't know. Uh, if somebody was lost, you know, uh, I have no explanation for that. But I do know that it was MH370 that crashed in Ukraine. I, I, I tend to agree with you, actually. I think it feeds in exactly what you're saying. I mean, a lot of people did point out the Gaza invasion timing of it. And, and when you look at who benefits, Israel does benefit on this one a lot. There's no doubt about it. Okay, I haven't got any more questions lined up right this second. Did you want to continue on, or do you want me to throw some direction? If I, uh, if, if I could ask, if I, if I could throw some direction at you, I would be really interested in you doing a bit of a rave about how you perceive the hierarchy of control in relation to the whole UFO thing, where we're going, who's pulling the strings, if you perceive a hierarchy of aliens, if you want to be... Um, specific. I'd like to know what your thoughts are there. You can draw on Lou Bolden stuff if you want to throw that in. And I guess a lot of people in the audience want to know where we're going, what does it mean, are we we're being invaded by aliens, are we part of just a, a garden of life forms all doing their own thing. Share with us your perspectives on the whole picture, if you could pan back and describe it. Okay, first of all, you have to understand the universe is infinite. The, um, the Earth is more than 13 billion years old. Um, there was no Big Bang to start all this. It's been going on forever. Uh, we are the product of a certain set of aliens. There's hundreds of trillions of aliens out there, but we are the product of one set of aliens. Um, the, the little greys, they're just uh, robots, or advanced robots, uh, that do the work for um, the aliens that uh, who engineered and manufactured us. Uh, we're here on Earth because we've all lived many lifetimes before, maybe 25 lifetimes, maybe 30 lifetimes, maybe more. But in a previous lifetime, each of us has made some mistake that we're sent down to Earth, which is only one of billions of prison planets where people who have made a mistake sent, are sent down to. And we're here to learn uh, how to live our lives with integrity and without envy, hate, or greed, and to love our families each and every day. And that's a real love, not uh, hiya, honey, as you're going out the door. Uh, that's what we have to learn uh, while we're here on Earth. Now, when we die, some of you will remember when Steve Jobs died here about uh, eight months ago. Uh, the last thing he said just before he passed away was, Oh, gosh. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> and what he was seeing was the reception area. And it's absolutely huge. And um, after you die, you go to the reception area. If you believe in God, uh, God meets you believe in Jesus, Jesus meets you. <clears throat> if you're a Buddhist, then uh, Buddha, Buddha meets you. Uh, if you're a Muslim, uh, the great guy will meet you. In my case, um, I believe in the great pumpkin, so the great pumpkin's going to meet me. But whoever you believe in meets you, and you get to meet all the friends that you've made in previous lifetimes. And then after about a half an hour of that, you go into a little room, and you're shown uh, all the wonderful and good things you did in your life, all the loving things you did in your life, and then you're shown all the nasty things. And most people, without exception, can't believe that uh, that was all recorded uh, and available for viewing, uh, that anybody could remember uh, all of the little nasty things they did all their life, but in fact they do. And after that, the decision is made, and I don't know exactly who makes the decision, you can either, you're either sent back down for 
uh, more work on learning how to live with integrity and without NDA to greed, or you get to stay there in the fourth dimension. The fourth dimension is what people here on Earth call heaven. But uh, if you take what you believe uh, to be heaven and then multiply it by a thousand, that's how great Keep it left. is. And uh, if you make the grade on living your life with integrity and without envy, hate, or greed, um, that's where you get to stay, and you'll stay there a couple of lifetimes, and then you go on up. And people ask, well, on up what, what dimension? There's no end to the dimensions. There's the fifth, sixth things, and they go on forever. And your life goes on forever. That's why we have to learn how to uh, navigate our soul and that's why we're here on earth is to straighten out the problems that we've had so far that's a good answer in fact um have you heard danny and brinkley do his talks on the subject danny and brinkley he uh, he did a skype um, presentation at our nexus conference last year he said that when you die not only do you experience um, everything you've put out but you experience the receiving end of it so every circumstance where you have um, generated a loving and harmonious and positive experience, you receive that. And each time that you put out a very hateful, uh, nasty comment experience, you receive what it was like to be on the receiving end of it. So Keep left. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you didn't quite go into uh, part B of the, of the question. Very interested in your take on the hierarchy on, on Earth. Who's in control of the information? Is there one country more on top of this than another? Um, I've, um, I've had experience of going to Russia um, uh, Valerie Uvarov, who I know you probably met at different conferences, he uh, invited Nexus over to Russia uh, quite a few years ago, and I was quite amazed to learn that, that President Putin uh, was very up-to-date and informed on all the matters of the UFOs, ancient archaeological anomalies. Uh, he had set up a, uh, an organisation and, and a lot of buildings called the National Security Academy of Russia, and uh, they were engaged in a program to uh, bring the Russian people up to a point of awareness so that they would be able to uh, handle uh, a type of emotional shock. Putin had made several comments to his um, followers, one of them being Valerie. Putin made the comment that one day the Russian people will wake up in the morning and the West will not be there. And Valerie said to me, the purpose of the National Security Academy of Russia is to bring the Russian people up to speed through concerts, magazines, TV shows, radio shows which bring the uh, Russian people to a state of emotional uh, awareness that we're not alone in the universe, that our past may not be what we've been told by the West. And um, his basic philosophy is he wants the Russian infrastructure to continue. He wants the trains to run on time, the food distribution network to continue to function, and uh, the people not to be in a state of shock. I hear similar uh, moves are underway in various South American countries and in China. Um, we've seen the French issue a very high-level report on UFOs, um, which basically surmises at the end, well, we're ready to tell more, but the Americans are saying no. I find when we're talking to Chinese UFO researchers that they also say that we're waiting for America to take the lead on this. So any, any, anything you can show from what you've um, picked up on this whole hierarchy of who's in control? Is it a nation? Is it a faction? A secret society? Um, go, go to town on that one if you've got any thoughts. No, it's not a secret society. Nobody runs anything except the ETs. They do exactly what we tell them to do. The leaders of the countries, uh, whenever they get to be leader, uh, there they have a uh, conversation with the ETs, and the ETs tell them how, you know, what they're going to do and where they're going to go and, and how it's all going to work out. Uh, as far as disclosure, um, I hear a lot about it's just around the corner. I don't think it's going to be here for at least 100 years. There's no reason to. There's no reason for everybody to know what's going on. We have enough problems here. Uh, that would just create a lot of chaos. Okay. Any, uh, any, any thoughts on the ET hierarchy? Have you detected any particular species of extraterrestrial that may be more on the higher on the food chain than the others? Uh, no, I, I don't know who they are. There, there's uh, 12 uh, types of ETs uh, around the Earth uh, keeping charge of what's going on. And uh, they're the ones that uh, pretty much handle everything. Uh, 
the there's a uh, renegade uh, part of the ETs who don't want to see us advance beyond uh, the, the technology that we're at now. There's another set of ETs that do want us to to advance, but they're in the minority right now, and that's why uh, the governments who have all this really cool stuff that we don't know about uh, keep that to themselves. So you're saying that you believe that there's a fair degree of cooperation between the different alien species? Uh, say that again? You believe that there's a fair degree of cooperation between the different oh, yeah. visitors? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, we recently ran an article in Nexus on Russian cosmonauts and their experiences in space. Um, not only were they seeing unusual craft nearby, but they had uh, very interesting, I guess you may call them psychic experiences, expanded awareness experiences. Um, in your conversations with people in the US space program, have you encountered or have you picked up information to suggest that their astronauts have had personal experiences while out there more than they're letting on? No, but uh, I can tell you the Apollo astronauts are absolutely positive that they went to the moon. Now, that's how far our mind control um, technology has gone to, where they absolutely believe it. There's no doubt in their minds uh, that they went to the moon, uh, but they didn't. And uh, uh, I had something else. Uh, what, were you, what did you just ask? Um, about astronauts' personal um, oh, psychic yeah, experiences. Yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, uh, we don't get a lot of what the uh, Russians did. For instance, um, Yuri Gagarin is supposed to be the first man into space, and the highest he ever got uh, was the top of the ladder to this uh, capsule that he was supposed to have landed in, uh, and they took a picture of him. That's the highest he ever got into space. So what do you think Richard Branson, who's about to launch a private orbital craft, orbital craft, what do you think Richard Branson's going to experience if he gets up there? It'd be interesting to see how, uh, how that goes. Uh, I, don't know, uh, I don't know what's going to happen there. Okay. Um, is there any other subjects you want to elaborate on that I'm holding you back from? Finding no, a that, new uh, route. If you've read... Uh, Jim Stone stuff that you know that uh, go straight um, on. Fukushima was uh, set off by an atomic bomb 120 miles north east of okay. uh, Fukushima. Let's find a new route uh, underwater, and that created the Please tsunami. Make a U-turn uh, when it possible. Created, uh, the start of all Never the damage. Mind. I'll the find Israelis a new route. have just gotten control of all 52 make of a the Japanese reactors by uh, <clears throat> rerouting. Never mind. By, um, I'll find a new um, route. Bidding on uh, controlling them. And uh, what happened is they were able to, after the atomic bomb was set off, uh, change uh, all the safeguards, turn them all off so that the maximum damage would occur. And the reason they did that was because they supposedly caught Japan uh, giving Iran uh, high grade. Uh, nuclear material such as plutonium um yeah look i've got to um maybe i shouldn't do this but i've got to i've got to say that i have an issue with jim, um, jim stone's fukushima um cosmic event mainly because the earthquake happened on the 11th and it was a big earthquake but 72 hours before then on the 9th there was a 7.2 earthquake which jim stone's theories do not explain and any decent seismologist is going to say well the earthquake on the 9th caused the mega earthquake on the 11th and because i mean you can see that i mean basically the whole place was was quiet and then on the finding 9th, a, a new route and then every 45 minutes there was a six six point eight turn left and then it built up to the big one i i totally understand what jim has said and why he said it but i'm Get not ready i'm to not turn so right. sure on it mainly because of that unexplained one on the 9th if jim came up with an explanation for that matched in with the theory turn right a lot more people and then turn with. right let's move on from 9-11 um, and Fukushima I'm still curious to know your um, I've turn heard you in other right. talks you've elaborated a lot more on the size of what some people call the secret space program um, the idea that man is actually out there flying around in advanced craft with bases on other moons 
etc., interacting on high-level projects. Some of the some of the scenario described by Lou in his books. Are you able to comment or elaborate on that? Well, I think his books are absolutely fascinating. As far as what we are, uh, what the uh, U.S. has done uh, is they used the money uh, for the fake Apollo and Gemini and uh, Mercury programs uh, to build uh, a constellation of 24 orbiting uh, weaponized um, uh, weaponized satellites, uh, plus two that were used for Havana control. Now the uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> World Trade Center one and two were destroyed by these uh, satellites. Uh, they're using uh, molecular, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the word, uh, molecular dissociation. And what they do is just take apart the makeup of concrete and um, steel. And that's what all that dust was floating around Manhattan. Uh, it was just the steel and uh, concrete coming apart into particles uh, 80 microns in diameter. And uh, what happened is after they, after everything was done and, and said, they wanted to build uh, a new uh, set of towers. And what they found out was um, this was the first time that this weapon of molecular dissociation uh, had been used at apparently full power. Well, what happened is they found out that uh, uh, it was not um, uh, self-quenching. And what that means is after they quit firing it, it did, the effects didn't stop. So that when they started to build the buildings where the World Trade Center uh, were, um, they would immediately rust uh, and they couldn't build there. So what they did is they made a reflecting pool in there that is the exact uh, dimensions of World Trade Center 1 and 2. Uh, and that was, they said that that was for, uh, you know, in, in memoriam of the people that were killed there. But the reason the reflecting pool is there is because they couldn't build anything there. And then they built the, uh, the new buildings around that uh, reflecting pool. Interesting. Hey, um, are, you, are you still active on the internet at Godlike Productions and any other forums that we can find you at? Um, not really. Uh, one of the things that I found out uh, in the past couple of years uh, is that uh, I used to drive between um, Las Vegas and Reno <clears throat> a lot, a lot of times because my parents lived up there. And halfway between Las Vegas and Reno, there's a little town called Hawthorne, Nevada. And it has a little lake there. It's about 15 miles long, uh, 15 miles long about 100 feet he deep. Left. And when you go into town, at the beginning of town, it says a big blue sign. It says Naval Undersea Warfare Center. And I always wondered what could be Undersea Warfare Center. I mean, that lake not going to hold any submarine. Uh, so what are they doing here? I finally found out about three years ago that what they Keep have left. is um, in Monterey Bay, there's an entrance. If you go onto Google, uh, you can see a canyon. And this canyon leads right up to the uh, shoreline of Monterey Bay. And the, the Navy found out that they can take their nuclear subs and go under uh, the 15 Western states of the United States. That includes uh, Nevada, California, Oregon, Washington, uh, Idaho, and so on. Uh, and the, those 15 Western states are floating on a plate and uh, they can navigate under that. And what they did was in Hawthorne has traditionally across the street from the Naval Weapons, or Naval um, Undersea uh, Warfare Center is a place where they made all kinds of uh, munitions uh, for uh, submarines and instead of having to ship it on trucks north through San Francisco or or south to uh, San Diego they just drive across the street and there's a huge elevator two elevators there um, and they go down 3400 feet the the um, elevation of uh, Hawthorne is 3400 feet and these elevators go down 
uh, to the Pacific Ocean. And they take these uh, munitions and everything they've made there and take it down, load up the submarine. There's a submarine pen under 3,400 feet under Hawthorne. And they have about 15 to 20 submarines there at any time. Uh, and they go back and forth. <clears throat> I'll just moderate interest, but they can go anywhere else uh, under these 15 states. Uh, they can go to Lake Tahoe. They can go to um, Pyramid Lake. They can go to um, uh, northern Idaho. There's a, a lake up there. They can go to um, uh, the uh, uh, naval uh, base at uh, Trona. I'm trying to think of what that is. Uh, anyway, they can go anywhere under those uh, um, states in the submarine. So you're talking submarine tunnels as well as high-speed transport tunnels? I didn't hear you, what did you think? I said you're talking um, submarine tunnels as opposed to just the high-speed rail network tunnels that are allegedly under the continent. So these are water tunnels? They're not channels. It's, it, it's a, a continental plate that sits on the, the ocean there. The ocean okay. covers the, the whole thing. Okay, thank you for doing that. Um, just, just for the record, in Australia we have we have um, a very sensitive base in the middle of the continent, and I have heard stories that we have submarine access to that base from the from the north and Keep coming out left. also in the south. Case we need to be The state of art of technology. You've given us an idea of what you, of of the holographic technology. Um, I've heard you mention in the past other branches of science Keep which are very left. developed. Um, was it you discussing teleportation? I'm sorry you're breaking up. I don't know whether it's mine or... Can you type it in for him? Ask him what he knows about teleporting. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Okay, go ahead. Can you hear me now? You're breaking up. Go ahead and ask the question. Okay, what is your view on the existence of robot humans and cyborgs amongst us? My opinion on uh, uh, robots, demons, and cyborgs? Not just demons and cyborgs, but artificial humans that are wandering around uh, amongst mankind. Have you heard stories of this? All I know about that is in 1980, a friend of mine uh, used to work for Solomon bin Laden. Solomon was the half-brother of uh, uh, Osama, and uh, I knew him quite well. Uh, lived in Cairo. Keep left. Uh, spent a lot of time with him. Uh, but the guy, his right-hand man, was a guy named Cecil Mathames. And Cecil used to work up at the test site uh, on the Blackbird program. And then he went to work as uh, uh, Solomon's right-hand man. And he would be over in uh, Saudi for, I think it was uh, eight left. weeks, and then he'd come back for three weeks. And he'd always come over to my house and tell me what was going on. <clears throat> and uh, one of the things he told me, he said, one night we're sitting there at the bar, and he says, John, what do you know about um, uh, clones? And I said, nothing. He said, well, it's all true. He said, I wish you could be a mouse in my pocket to see what I've seen. So apparently they, uh, in 1980, they had uh, quite a big uh, army of clones there. And I don't know why they were doing it in Saudi, uh, but that's where they were doing it. Uh, that's most interesting. I'll just add a little rider to that. Um, I have had one or two reports of um, people who have come to me reporting cloned humans. All the cloned humans I've heard about have always been in the context of elite military units which are associated with UFO crash retrievals. It would appear that um, they're very cloned. Are you familiar with um, Ingo Swan's work? Yes, very, and he moved to Las Vegas and unfortunately I didn't get to meet him uh, uh, before he passed away. But uh, his book talks a lot about uh, uh, the, the people on the moon and uh, working in the caves. And one of the most interesting things is that when they worked, they, they didn't have any clothes on. And I don't know what that was all about. Yeah, one of the interesting things in Ingo's book, Penetration, 
was that when he was taken the first time to do his remote viewing of the moon, the um, the two agents that he that, that were tasked to him, and Ingo don't forget is quite a psychic person as well as a remote viewer, very sensitive, and he's met twins before. But these two identical twins, he felt there was something very strange about them. He'd never perceived twins like this before, and. Um, I felt at the time that they were clones, but of course, in Ingo's day, he probably wouldn't have even considered the concept. But he experienced and encountered those two uh, later on again, and um, it's interesting. Okay, now, the Philadelphia experiment. Oh. I, all I know about that is uh, Lou Bolin, uh, who has written some great books, and uh, for those of you that uh, uh, haven't read any of his books, uh, I suggest you... Um, get the number one is the UFOs in the Year of the Dragon and the other is uh, uh, in league with a UFO and the other is a day with an extraterrestrial and those are the three best books about what's going on uh, in space as far as ETs that I've ever read so um, what Lou said is the uh, keep right the Philadelphia and then exit was right real. Uh, it was successful and it's been covered up ever since okay I need you now to give the audience some context of exit who Lou right. Golden is or was and why he would have such authority to write these books I've keep read his books right. and I find them equally compelling but maybe you should um, give the audience a bit of context about him Oh, Lou? Yeah, who was he? Why? Uh, how does he know this information? Uh, Lou showed up on uh, above.secret.com in uh, 19 or in 2005. Uh, he started writing about uh, being on a, a saucer, being in the military. Uh, and as I read through uh, the first 19 pages of 120 pages, it struck me after researching all this for maybe Keep 30 left. years. This guy is believable. He knows what he's talking about. And so uh, I kind of hooked up with him and defended him on some of the people that were attacking him. But uh, we got to be very good friends. And uh, uh, he has some excellent information. Uh, I believe it all, uh, except for the part where he says that uh, the, um, um, the uh, he believes that Armstrong and Aldrin were allowed a peak on the moon. And uh, other than that, I agree with all the rest of the stuff he talks about. So, I just want to clarify this then. You believe that Lou Bolden is, is, is Keep describing right humans running and around then in turn space, right. and yet it seems to be in contrast to your belief that no human has ever gone past the Val Allen Turn Hill. right. Are you suggesting that the humans that Lou is dealing with are not from this Earth, or or uh, have been um, seconded into secret units where they're allowed to travel in alien spacecraft. How does that, how do you reconcile that? You say he's talking about uh, meeting well, humans in space? Well, in Lou's books, he's dealing and interacting with other humans on bases on, on moons of the planets in the solar system. Right, they come from all of the uh, other billions of trillions of uh, universes in our... Um, okay, you've know, answered my question. So those humans that Lou is meeting and interacting with on the spaceships and on the planetary bases, those are not humans from Earth? Is that what you're saying? Some of them are, but not all of them. Uh, when I am talking about uh, us not going to the moon, you know, that we may have gone in the past 20 years. I'm just saying that... Uh, the technology in uh, 1969 uh, was not Keep right uh, and then sufficient exit enough right. for us to go then. Yeah, no. Um, we sent you a copy of the article in the current issue of the exit Texas, right. where the U.S. current administration has tried to investigate going back to the moon, and we find that we don't remember how to do it anymore. Turn right hilarious. and then yeah, keep Yeah, I sent a copy left. to John before the conference, but um, there's an article on the current issue of Nexus, which basically shows Keep that left. Obama tried to commission a project left. where we were going to put manned space base on the moon. 
turn and all left. The scientists went off and did all the calculations, and they said, "We don't know how we got to the moon the first time. We don't know how <laughs> we passed safely through the Van Allen belt. We don't know how we got them off the moon surface and back back to Earth. We can't do it again, and we can't find the information that that we did it all those years ago." And bear in mind that in that time we've had miniaturization of technology. We have got vast. I mean, the, the computing power back then. Keep left. What's in a laptop computer now would have taken up an entire room. So we've got advanced technology on computing and propulsion and fuels, but even so, they still cannot get a man back to the moon. And that's what they had to go back to the, the president and Keep say. We've left. got an article on it in the current issue of Nexus. It's written by a science journalist who usually appears in um, science professional science magazines, but he's had to write under a pseudonym. Keep right, and, and then turn Nexus. right. Yeah. And the uh, science journals have um, have turned right. So it's uh, an interesting situation. I've got a couple more questions here. The um, there is a lot of talk out there using um, I think Operation Blue Beam was was discussed. The idea that they can use this holographic advanced technology to simulate a false flag invasion of aliens or of uh, of another nation. This is where it ends. Do you think there's any? Agenda to um, to make aliens a, 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 a the next baddie um, in, in any of this? Do you pick up any um, chatter on that that topic, or is it just internet gossip? No, I used to hear a lot of that. Uh, I don't hear anymore. Uh, I think that would be causing a lot of problems uh, for themselves to uh, <clears throat> make a false flag like that. Uh, but who knows? Yeah, it's definitely a topic which came out of the Christian conspiracy. Uh, movement in America. I think a lot of people out there are starting to um, awake to the idea that you could have, you could use this tech, this holographic technology to uh, stimulate the reappearance of Jesus Christ, and it would probably work. The people would believe, and it would be miracles. <laughs> Is Billy Meyer credible? Hang on. Okay, I'm getting a few questions passed up here. The International Space Station. Can you tell? Can you reconcile how the International Space Station functions and works in relation to all this? Is it the case that it's not in the danger zone? And um, what else can you tell us? Well, you'll remember that when the shuttle used to go up, it used to take them three days to get there. And uh, we used to argue with uh, uh, one of uh, NASA's um, morons, Jim Ober, and um, we would say, you know, the Russians can get there in a couple hours. Why did it take us three days to get up there? And uh, he would say, oh, well, uh, they, you know, you don't know anything about orbital mechanics and uh, how difficult it is to line up with this and that and so on and so on. And, and uh, then we say, Time to uh, hit also, the road. when people or when the Russians come back from, uh, the ISS, it only takes them two hours. Why did it take us two and a half days? Oh, well, you know, first of all, our astronauts are so tired from all the stuff they had to do on the ISS that uh, we had to give them uh, two complete rest periods and this and that and so on. It was really baloney. What they were doing was when the shuttle would go up, uh, it was carrying an immense amount of material for the satellites that I told you about, the 24 uh, weaponized satellites. Turn left. Uh, and they were distributing that all the way when they were going up. When they'd get to the space station and they'd open the uh, the uh, the door, the, the hatch of the cargo door there, you could see that only half the space was used, and that was never explained. Where, why didn't they fill it up? The other thing is, every time the shuttle went, the Russians, two days prior to that, would send up a Soyuz. And uh, we managed on the livingmoon.com to get a hold of um, um, a manifest, cargo manifest, and uh, the majority of it was fruit every time, um, fresh fruit. And so they, uh, they would say, well, you know, the ISS, the, the people up there, We'll get it. I've got time for any more questions if you want to jot them down. The Get ready to turn right. Simon Parks also refuses to fly on any aeroplane. That's why he was Skyped. He refuses to fly on any aeroplane. So. 
As you turn can see, he's right. an interesting chap. He doesn't hold views that a lot of people subscribe to. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with all his um, conclusions myself, but he bases his conclusions on usually some inside research and connections. So we've reached the stage now. Where I'm basically going to be asking Keep his left opinion on a few and then turn left. So if you want his if you want his opinion on any high profile cases, turn I'll left. Run through a few of them. Yeah, good boy, good idea. We're getting him back. I'm getting the thumbs up. I think John Lee is going to go down as one of the high profile characters in the golden age of ufology out here. That's why I wanted to get him at a conference. What did Putin mean when he said the West would disappear? Putin's comment was that one day Russia would wake up and the West would not be there as we know it. That, that was the wording. The West would not be there as we know it. He didn't say it would disappear. Um, Keep right a bit of a and then there. exit right. I'll just elaborate on that while we're waiting for, for John. The um, Putin has... Exit and right. Bear this in mind when you're listening to all this, this rubbish. Okay, he's back. Yeah. Okay. Keep Where left. Were we before you got cut and off? then continue you were talking straight about on. the cargo hold being half empty. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which, Go are, straight are you on. implying that there's manned space stations in orbit or or that the people in the space station just eat a lot of fruit? Yeah, we have um, we have 24 weaponized uh, space stations which have um, a number of crew members, maybe as much as five, plus two, two stations command and control, uh, which have a number of people in there. There's a lot of people up there, and I estimate that our Keep astronaut right, corps and then uh, turn right. is a thousand or more at this time. Uh, we, uh, we're using the, the uh, Russians right. to go up as a cover uh, for all the people we're sending up. We have at least three different Go straight types on. of uh, rockets uh, that are man-capable. Keep left, uh, and, and they take off from uh, Kwajalein Island. And uh, there's traffic that goes turn up left. there all day long. Are you talking um, NASA or just American? Part, uh, the traffic that's going well, no, on uh, that uh, island. The uh, Air Force, Navy... Okay, while we're getting back, I'll continue about Putin. Um, yes, right now you're being conditioned into thinking Russia is the new enemy. It's something I've been watching being ramped up in the mainstream media for several years. The UK particularly keen on it. When somebody is being positioned as the new baddie, you need to really think about what's going on. There's some amazing statements made by Putin in answers to journalists' questions about the Ukraine crisis really suggest you take a, a moment out there on the internet and read what Putin says on his point of view. You'll have a very different picture from what the mainstream is saying. We still have a problem. Okay. We may, we may have to um, terminate everybody. All right. We've had a few problems here, John, but we're holding in. Okay. Can Truby pointed out that... Uh, the U.S. is trying to make a, an enemy of Russia uh, by uh, claiming that uh, Putin shot down uh, MH17. Uh, but, of course, it wasn't MH17. It was 370, and Russia didn't shoot it down. It was the uh, Israelis who uh, put it up there in the first place. Okay, ready for another question? Sure, go ahead. The Black Knight Satellite. What have you heard or know about the Black Knight Satellite? And maybe you could explain what you know of it generically for the people in the audience who've never heard of it. The Black Knight Satellite is uh, a saddle, is a um, craft that was uh, taken by, uh, pictures taken by uh, STS-88. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it has the pictures of uh, this thing. Uh, uh, it not in the same orbit, but they got good pictures of it. What it is, is this is a, um, a um, advanced uh, U.S. Um, spacecraft uh, that uses the same technology that uh, Space One uh, that uh, Bert Rutan designed uses, and that's, um, um, I'm trying to think of what they call a pop-top, um, thermal thermalization 
And what it does is the um, uh, it's launched in a rocket. The rocket, when it gets into space, opens up and this thing comes out. This thing can travel all around a different spacecraft and it's ready to come back to Earth. The tail comes up and it can actually float down instead of re-entering at 18,000 miles an hour and thereby defeating um, any restrictions uh, that were uh, in place regarding the amount of rockets that we can have. And uh, so this was ac by accident that the SDS got these pictures and the people who were in charge of this secret program, uh, they couldn't get to it fast enough to stop it from coming out. So what they did is they said it was a UFO and named it the Black Knight UFO. But it's obviously um, Earth-type Earth technology. Uh, I have dozens of pictures of it. And uh, there's no way that uh, ETs would uh, have a spacecraft like that. Just none. Yeah, it sort of looks like a, a vertical space shuttle. It does look pretty weird. I just want to come back to the topic of alien implants in humans. What's your take and perception as to the purpose of these? You know, I don't know too much about that. Uh, Dr. Lear and uh, some of the others were very knowledgeable. I don't know what they do or what they're for. I, sorry about that. Drive safe. Did Lou never come up with any perspective on why... I mean, why, why, why are these aliens picking humans, experimenting, toying with them, putting implants in? What's, what's your, if you pan back, what's your big picture about why the aliens are doing that with us? Why would they want to interact with a little lowly species like us? Have we got something they want or? Well, no, they made us. They engineered us. They grew us. And we're just one strand of billions of strands of people, you might say, or mankind uh, that they made. And all they're doing is just checking up on uh, how we're doing. They regulate, uh, uh, you know, everything that we do. Um, all life is planned. Uh, there's no such thing as uh, freedom of uh, uh, will or any of that stuff. It's, this, this is all planned. Good answer. I also picked up some information on the purpose of alien implants. I'll share it with you as well. I was told by a reliable source that um, a lot of alien implants are uh, almost the equivalent of a, a cattle ear tag. Tells you who the farmer is, what their biostatistics were last time they were checked on, their temperature, their size, their weight, whether they had parasites. And any farmer can come along and scan that tag and get the information. Um, I was told that a lot of humans are literally tagged in, in that way, that, that any alien civilization visiting us for the first time can scan a populace and see which other civilizations have got scientific experiments going on, which humans and which bloodlines. Are you okay there, John? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Yeah. No, that's, that's <laughs> I just thought you were throwing, You sounded like you were throwing up in the background. Okay. Um, <laughs> making this easy for me. Knowing what you know, could you give one piece of advice to mankind in order to move, in order to be able to move forward and break through control mechanisms? Are we doomed to be um, part of a farmyard of, of control or do you feel we have the ability to break free or do you feel that it's not important to break free and that we're here just to act with integrity? As I said before, the only thing you have to worry about is living your life with integrity, without envy, without hate, without greed, and expressing your love to your family each and every day. And this is Get not ready a, to turn hi, up. honey, as you're going out the door. This is taking your family in your arms, and hugging them, and telling how turn much left. you love them. That's all you have to do. Give you our thanks. Just before you go, though, the, the question before about... Are you lurking on any internet conspiracy forums that the audience can contact you at? I know you had a thread going at Godlike Productions. Keep I don't know right. whether you've been booted off there by now or... Yeah, Godlike Productions is usually what I... Uh, yeah, what they, I, booted, uh, they booted me off permanently, though. I can't even get back on and ask you. What about and, and Living my, Moon? 
Living Moon website? Can they contact you via there? Uh, it's hard to do that uh, because um, Ron Schmidt, who runs it, has not been well lately. Yes. But uh, my email is johnlear at cox.net. Okay, if anyone in the audience wants to send him an email on something urgent, email me and I can forward it on, or you can take notes. Okay, this is the Nexus crowd giving you a big round of applause and saying thank you very much for being part of our conference. Okay. <laughs> there you have it, folks, the legendary wow. John Lear. Yes, it's the Gay Family Series starring Lucille Ball with Richard Denning, brought to you by the Jell-O family of desserts. J-E-L-L-O -L. Keep oh, right and the then big red exit letters right. stand for the Jell-O family. Oh, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. That's Jell-O. Exit yum, right. Yum. Jell-O puddings. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O tap. Fioca pudding. Keep right. Yes, sorry. And then turn right. And now Lucille Ball with Richard Denning turn as Liz right. and George Cooper. Two people who live together and like it. As we look in on the Coopers, it's early evening and they've just finished dinner. You haven't made any plans for tonight, have you, Liz? No, why? How would you like to go for a little ride? Go for a ride? Hmm. What for? We're married. <laughs> well... I thought you might like to go for a ride in a brand new 1950 automobile. Brand new 90... Oh, George, you darling, you don't mean that Yes, you... I do. Oh. The Atterbury's got their new car today. <laughs> what? And they're coming over to take us for a ride. Oh, Keen. I thought you meant you finally broke down and bought a new car. No chance. You know we can't afford it. But, George, I don't see why we Oh, now, can't... don't start in, Liz. We have a perfectly good car. It gets us where we want to go. Yes, but it needs fixing. The eyes and glass curtains are all shot. <laughs> we need new wicks in the headlamps. <laughs> Never mind, Liz. We're keeping that car. Well, all right, if you want a wife with one leg bigger than the other. What are you talking about? The battery's always going dead. Well, what of it? Well, how do you think I started? I have to open the door, put one foot on the running board, and push it like a scooter. Liz. I got a right leg like Betty Grable and a left leg like Gorgeous George. <laughs> now, stop it. You're just being ridiculous. Your leg is nothing like Betty Grable's. <laughs> well. Oh, uh, there they are. Come on, let's go out and take a look at their new car. Yeah, I want to eat my heart out. George boy, Liz girl, how do you like it? Wow, what a car. Well, Liz, what do you say? Oh, it's beautiful, Iris. Look at all that fancy schmancy chrome. Now that's what the front of a car should look like. That's the back. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> how do you like the color of the car, Liz? Oh, it's absolutely gorgeous. Where'd you ever find such a lovely shade of black? <laughs> Wasn't my idea. I wanted a canary yellow convertible with leopard skin upholstery. But Rudolph is president of a bank, so we always end up with black. Feel like I'm riding in a hearse. <laughs> Lotus bud. <laughs> It's true, Liz. One day we accidentally cut through a funeral and half the cars followed us home. <laughs> Lotus bud. Keep that up and the cars won't be following you accidentally. <laughs> Why, Mr. Atterbury. Uh, George, George, I want to show you something. Come around here to the back. I, I mean the front. There's a bumper that guards the guard, that guards the bumper, that guards the grill guard, that guards the grill. You don't get to the motor for three feet. <laughs> Iris, uh, have you asked him yet? No, girl. He's so happy, I hate to say anything. But look, if he agreed to, uh, to, to, to teach you how to drive, if he got a new car, now, now what goes? Well, you know, he promised me a fur coat instead, but I, I think that was a campaign promise to get my vote. Well, let me bring up the subject. 
Maybe he won't want to refuse in front of George and me. Gee, Mr. Atterbury, that really is something. Oh, Liz, you ought to see that grill. It's a honey. Yes, dear. Oh, Iris. Yes, Liz? I suppose now that you've got a new car, you'll be learning how to drive. Oh, yes. Uh, Rudolph promised he'd teach me. Didn't you, Rudolph? Rudolph, did you hear me? Are you going to teach me to drive? Yes and no. <laughs> what do you mean, yes and no? Yes, I heard you, and no, I'm not going to teach you to drive. <laughs> Well, I just don't think you're being fair, Mr. Atterbury. George taught me to drive three years ago. Yes, and I just stopped shaking this morning. <laughs> well, you're a big help. Look, it's no use. My mind is made up. But, Rudolph, listen, you... Listen, Iris, listen. In my day, I've done many things that I'm not proud of. I've attached salaries and repossessed cars and foreclosed on mortgages. But I couldn't stand to have it on my conscience that I put another woman driver on the streets. <laughs> Why, you pompous tub of lard. <laughs> pompous? <laughs> oh, never mind, Iris. He's not the only teacher in the world. I know a wonderful driver who, who'll be glad to teach you how to drive. You do? Who is it? Me. <laughs> oh, no. Liz, are you out of your mind? Certainly not. I can teach Iris. In a few weeks, you'll be driving just the way I do. Yeah. What a frightening thought. Don't worry, Iris. We'll show him. Liz? What? I absolutely forbid you to teach Iris to drive. Is that clear? Is that clear? Yes, George. And Iris, I absolutely forbid you to let Liz teach you to drive. Understand? Yes, Rudolph. George. Rudolph! No! You know, Iris, I think they mean it. Hi, Iris. Hi, Liz. Ready for your driving lesson? <sighs> All ready, Liz girl. I just dropped Katie at the market. She'll meet me here later. Say... There's your car in the driveway. How come Mr. Atterbury left it home? Well, he started to drive to the bank, and then suddenly he couldn't stand the thought of taking that beautiful, shiny new car into traffic. Well, I'm glad he left it. Now I can teach you to drive in your own car. Well, we won't hurt it, will we, Liz? I'd hate him to find out what we're doing. Oh, don't be silly. We'll be doing him a favor by breaking it in. <laughs> If he ever finds out, he'll murder me. Iris, your husband has no right to keep you from learning to drive. It's just a plot so he can have the car all the time. Go yeah. straight on. You have a legal keep right to learn to and drive. And then turn left. Yeah. <laughs> turn left. You can qualify for a license as soon as you're past 18, and boy, do you qualify. <laughs> yeah. Liz! Oh, you know what I mean. Come on, let's get in your car. Well, why don't you get in? I can't fit in that little space behind the wheel. Well, there's not nearly enough... Oh, now, to... don't get excited, Iris. Luckily, you have an adjustable seat. <laughs> I have? <laughs> no, the car. Oh! There, now get in. There, that's better. Uh-oh, what's the matter? With the seat back, your feet don't reach the pedals. How do you like that husband of mine? He deliberately bought the wrong size car for me. <laughs> Iris, cars don't come in sizes. People do. Now we'll just slip the seat forward a little. There. Yeah. Now, I'll explain the whole thing to you. Those two pedals under your feet are the clutch and the brake. Which is which? Well, the one on the... No, the one on the... Well, it's easier to tell when the car's moving. <laughs> How? 
Well, it's very simple. If you step on the brake and if you don't stop, it's a clutch. <laughs> oh, well, that sounds easy enough. Yeah. Now we'll start the car. We turn the keys like this. Mm -hmm. Now the ignition's on. Uh. Step on the starter. Okay. <laughs> what are you doing, Iris? I'm trying to get my foot up on the dashboard. <laughs> Why? Well, you told me to step on the starter, and that's where it is. Oh. Keep right. Oh, oh in my car, right. it's on the floor. Well, push it. It turn started. right. It started. Hooray, I'm driving! <laughs> Hold it, girl. There's more. You have, have to be moving. have at your destination. Oh. Your rap guidance is well, now What finished. do I do now? Push in the clutch. Try the pedal on the left. Okay. Now pull this gear thing down toward you. All right. Here it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, that's even better than I do. Now, here we go. Let the clutch out very slowly and smoothly. All right. <laughs> there. How was that? Great. In case you find something rolling around the back seat, it's my head. <laughs> Hey, look at me, Liz. Now I'm driving. <laughs> How am I doing? Well, you're going awfully crooked. Drive straight. I am driving straight. The car's going crooked. <laughs> well, you'd better do what I do. See that white line down the middle of the road? Yes. Yeah. Well, get one wheel on either side. <laughs> and your radiator cap right on the line, and you can go straight as a die. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gee, this is fun. <laughs> All right, now, now I'll show you a wonderful invention. See that little mirror right above the windshield? Yeah. What do you see in it? Oh, I see out the back window. Oh, no, no, it's not adjusted right. Fix it so you can see yourself. <laughs> okay. There, see? That's so you can put on lipstick while you're driving and still keep one hand on the wheel. <laughs> Well, what won't they think of next? Okay, Iris, now I'm going to teach you to turn a corner. It's just like going straight, only you give the wheel a big jerk and go in a different direction. <laughs> oh, is that all? Oh, of course, you have to have to make a hand signal. There's a signal for turning left, turning right, and stopping. Well, what are they? Well, they're all the same. You just stick your hand out the window and wave it. <laughs> but uh, how can they tell what you're going to do? They can't, but as soon as they see it's a woman's hand, they stop until you've done it. <laughs> now, now, turn at this next corner. Am I ready for it? Well, no, but we don't have much choice. It's a dead-end street. <laughs> there we are. Nice work, Iris. Mm. Home, safe and sound, and not a scratch. And you park beautifully. Oh, it was easy with you working the brake for me. <laughs> and now, my prize pupil, I've decided you are ready to solo. Solo? Yes. I'm going to get out, and you're going to drive around the block alone. I can't. Of course you can. Katie's waiting for me in my car. I'll stay here with her, and you go around the block and pull up and park in back of us. Well... Okay, if you say so. Wish me luck. Good luck. You know. <laughs> oh, gee, I can hardly believe she's only had one lesson. Hi, Katie. Hello, Mrs. Cooper. I've been waiting for you. Did you see Mrs. Atterbury? This is her first time alone. She's going to drive around the block all by herself. Oh, do you think she can do it? Certainly. Oh, my goodness, there she comes now, down at the corner. She sure got around the block fast enough. Oh, why is she driving so close to the curb? Don't worry, she's going to park in back of us. Well, does she know how? Katie, I taught her, didn't I? Would I be sitting here if I didn't think she'd stop in plenty of time? To... Ah! Ah! <laughs> What's the matter with her? She's getting out. Here she comes. Why 
didn't you put your hand out? <laughs> what? We were standing still. You ran into us. Oh, that's right. How bad are the cars? I'm afraid to lie. <laughs> oh, now, don't cry, Iris. Here, let me take a look. Oh, they're not smashed too bad. Uh, how will we explain this to our husbands? Well, crying isn't going to... Our husbands. Ah! I forgot about them. Ah! Well, maybe I'm wrong.